it's so great to be here and in this historical place, Marie Grove. It's, it's wonderful. And it's also wonderful to be with fellow UUs. Um, I'd like to share a favorite reading with you. We all of us, whether we have children of our own or not, are caretakers for the next generation coming up. I can think of no better words than those of Libby Roderick, whose poem, Winter Wheat, was included in the book Moral Ground, Ethical Action for a Planet in Peril. When I was young, I thought failure was impossible. All wrongs would be righted in my time. Now I am old, I see that failure is impossible. I pass the torch to you. Will you hold it high? For we are sowing winter wheat that other hands will harvest, that they might have enough to eat after we are gone. We will plant shade trees that we won't sit under. We will light candles that others can see their way. We'll struggle for justice, though we'll never see it flower. Our children's children will live in peace one day. When I was young, I thought that there were no human enemies. People must be taught to hate and fear. Now I am old. <clears throat> I know that there are no human enemies, but only souls in pain. And we can reach them if we dare. So we are sowing winter wheat that other hands will harvest, that they might have enough to eat after we're gone. Each generation passes like the leaves on old oak trees whose roots are strong. Each new generation bursts like the spring, and they will be the ones to carry on. When I was young, I dreamed the earth was healed and whole again. Creatures, trees, and rivers, free and wild. Now I am old, I dream the planet healed and whole again. That dream is reborn forever in the heart of each new child. So we are sowing winter wheat that other hands will harvest, that they might have enough to eat after we are gone. We will plant shade trees that we will not sit under. We will light candles that others can see their way. We'll struggle for justice, though we'll never see it flower. Our children's children will live in peace one day. Our children's children will live in peace one day. So with all the pressing social justice needs that I feel that we feel all the time. I've chosen to focus on climate change, climate disruption, both inside the walls of our Unitarian Universalist congregation and outside. Um, and um, you did mention some of the things. And I just wanted to mention the Citizens Climate Lobby. Um, we were the first group uh, in Lincroft to start. Now we have seven. And thanks to Dale Mattern, your own Dale, there is a group starting in this area. So thank you so much for that. So um, I'd be, and I wanted to mention that um, Jan had started the Climate Change Initiative at the UU United Nations office. And we'd be glad to talk with you about those things um, after the service. For now, I'm using this opportunity to really take a look inside about why I'm focusing on something that people say may be nigh on to impossible. First, to get really basic, why do we UUs even bother with any social justice? Sometimes it seems like the same old, same old problems keep coming up year after year. I envision the myth of Sisyphus pushing that boulder up the hill, and then it rolls back down again. Maybe, sometimes it feels like we're not making headway, and then it might be tempting to just give up. But then, think for a moment what, what you do to try to make the world a better place. Could you imagine not doing what you're doing? So probably for most of us, that would be impossible to imagine. Uh, we would not want to settle for the way things are. And we keep on trying to make them the way the things they ought to be. And this is the prophetic voice deep within us that makes us impossible for us not to try to bend the arc 
of the moral universe toward justice. So for me, all these needs, uh, climate change often seems far away in time and space, and maybe it's pretty wonky. It might, it might seem that way. And it's hard for people, even well-educated Unitarian Universalists, to get their minds and their hands around what to do about climate change. So I've learned a lot that's helped me address this. First, it's not about polar bears, disappearing natural settings, <coughs> dying trees. It's not only an environmental issue. In fact, in his book, don't even think about it, why our brains are wired to ignore climate change. George Marshall, who's a climate communicator, says that the initial framing of climate change as an environmental issue was probably a big mistake and was part of why climate change became so politically polarized. Tree huggers wearing Birkenstocks and eating granola, you know. Okay. So saying that, growing up I got to see some of our interconnected web our seventh principle, because of spending summers in the California Redwood Mountains and learning at my dad's knees that even the soil around my radishes were very rich in nutrients. But the concept of the whole network, the interconnected web, is complete only with justice issues and thinking about people. And they're being hurt right now by climate imbalance and how it's going to get worse if we continue business as usual. As a social worker, I saw how many people right in our own country struggle to pay the rent and have nutritious meals. Climate imbalance exacerbates that. And I'm thinking about the victims of Superstorm Sandy. Some still don't have their own homes. And internationally, in the Copenhagen Climate Talks in 2009, I listened to a man from the Philippines who said climate change affects threatens their very existence. And a man from Africa said even a two degree Celsius uh, increase in carbon dioxide emissions would be suicide for his country. And as you know, two degrees is the uh, ambition set, set in the recent Paris talks, although they wrote in 1.5 as possibly a stretch uh, limit. So. Um, I did go to workshops and exhibits on people being flooded out of their homes, women standing in floodwaters in, in their huts, waiting for the men to bring back some food from somewhere, if they could find it. And you know the pictures of starving children, and you've heard how the conflict over increasingly scarce resources is becoming even more desperate, and it's going, they're going to become more frequent. Both the Syrian conflict and the earlier Darfur conflict are said by analysts to be caused in part by climate change. And just thinking of the human cost of all those conflicts. And people can no longer stay in their homes, even if they weren't destroyed, when there are violent conflicts. And resource scarcity and floods and drought, they become climate refugees. And where will they go? We see what's already happening with Syrian refugees in Europe and our own country's unwillingness to lend a hand. Yes, all of this, massive changes in basic needs for human beings right now, shelter, food, clean water, and massive changes in population movements. But what gets me, touches my heart, is this. The 10-year-old Indonesian boy at a workshop in Paris explaining how he had to walk farther and farther each day to fetch drinkable water and missing school. Many, many like him. Seeing our own supermarket shelves in Lincroft empty of drinking water as Superstorm Sandy loomed. I don't know what it was like for you if we, when we knew the storm was coming. And thinking about our, our gentle 10-year-old grandson maybe Yes, even in the United States, having to struggle to get drinking water in the face of rising seas and increasingly <coughs> strong storm surges. Our congregation just celebrated Earth Day, which coincided with Passover, with a song from the Shalom Center's Freedom Seder for the Earth. The song says, among other lyrics, gather round 
for the children keep the circle whole. Keeping the integrity of the earth in its interconnectedness is a moral imperative. Climate imbalance, disruption, breaks the circle that includes human beings realizing the highest dreams of civilization. Being pushed back to the hunter-gatherer stage where we were before the climate became relatively stable 10 to 12,000 years ago, um, even for survivors, uh, they're struggling for basic sustenance, being hunter-gatherers back again. They're, they won't be able to create or study at the university, for example. I don't think there would be chamber music. So thinking about why I'm spending so much time and energy on climate change, considering everything, that which touches me most <coughs> is thinking of my responsibility to the children to the generations coming up. It's not too late. There are hopeful signs for a sustainable future. One I'm following is um, our Children's Trust, which just won a second judicial victory based on the public trust doctrine. And their goal is to secure the legal right to a healthy atmosphere and stable climate for all present and future generations. Plaintiffs in the landmark Oregon case, which uh, just got settled in uh, April, early April, were elementary and high school age with Dr. James Hansen on behalf of upcoming generations. In the legislative arena, there's progress too. 13 Republicans have co-sponsored a resolution asking Congress to consider climate change based on science and have a responsibility to develop solutions. And there's a new bipartisan Climate Solutions Caucus that has 12 members, six from each party. That's the Noah's Ark Caucus. You have to have two people going in at once, but one Republican and one Democrat. And a lot of that was due to nurturing by citizens' climate lobby, um, citizens' voices. So it's not too late, but securing a livable world is not going to happen by itself. We, the people, are needed now to push that boulder over the hill. And I think of Mark Hertzgard's letter to his daughter, Kiara, who's the same age as our grandson, a letter to be opened in 2020 to be given to her if something happened to him. And he wrote this in his book, 2011 book called Hot, Living Through the Next 50 Years. He says, I share this today with the proviso that we are already feeling the effects of global warming and they will get worse. And he writes to his daughter, Dear Kiara, since you're turning 15 today, you'll be reading these words in the year 2020, a cardinal date for the challenge described in this book. According to the scientists I interviewed, many, many things have to happen by 2020 if this planet is to remain a livable place. One question I thought about while writing this book was where you should live in, in the future in order to stay safe. Choose carefully. If it were me, I'd look for a place that has a secure water supply, a capable government, and a vibrant community. A place where people know how to work with their hands, where they look out for one another and practice the golden rule. I don't think there's much more I can tell you, Kiara. You'll, you'll know so much in 2020, but I don't know today. In 2020, you'll know whether our country and the world are making, not just promising, but making the dramatic reductions in greenhouse gas emissions that are needed for your generation to avoid the worst scenarios of climate change. At this point, my precious, beautiful daughter, all that's clear is that our civilization is entering a storm. There's no way around it. We have to go through it. We have to be brave, resourceful, and never give up. I would give my life to see you safe on the other side. With more love than I can say, Daddy. So, and he ends the letter there. Echoing George Marshall, 
All I can add is that we need to bring about a transformative tipping point where acting on climate becomes a non-negotiable sacred value. We will plant shade trees that we will not sit under. We will light candles that others can see their way. We'll struggle for justice, though we'll never see it flower. Our children's children will live in peace one day. Our children's children will live in peace one day. Thank you. Thank you.